Well, hello everybody, Mike Prevost from MikePrevost.com here. And today I want to talk about omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids and inflammation. So you've probably heard that omega-3 fatty acids, primarily you know, taken as fish oils, can reduce inflammation. And you may have heard that omega-6 fatty acids are inflammatory. You might have heard of the inflammatory effects of, um, of industrial processed seed oils, that kind of a thing. So today I want to talk about that theory, get into a little bit of the physiological mechanisms, maybe provide a little counter evidence, and then give you something to think about. Okay, let's get started. So I want to start by defining some terms and talking about some structures so you'll have an understanding of what I'm talking about later. So we store fat in a molecule called a triglyceride, and a triglyceride is what I'm showing here, and the triglyceride is basically a molecule of glycerol, which is this portion right here, and then three fatty acids attached to it. Okay, and the fatty acids are long carbon chains. So that's a triglyceride molecule. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the fatty acid portion next. Well, now we've broken that triglyceride molecule down in a process called lipolysis. Lipolysis is just fat breakdown or are the first step in fat burning. And we break that molecule down into a molecule of glycerol over here, okay? And uh, when that molecule of glycerol is split off from the triglyceride, it's sent to the liver to be converted to glucose. So believe it or not, you can make glucose or sugar from fat, and this is how you do it for, with the glycerol portion of that molecule. Now the other portion are the three fatty acids. So each of those fatty acids are broken off from the glycerol and these it produces three distinct fatty acids and those fatty acids are used for energy for those who have a little bit more biochemistry background those fatty acids are uh, basically chopped up into two carbon units that are converted to something called acetyl CoA so this is an expanded view of a fatty acid and this happens to be an 18 carbon fatty acid you can see all the c's those are the carbons uh, in fact this is an omega-3 fatty acid so how do i know it's an omega-3 fatty acid well we count and we count from what's called the omega end okay so this carbon is the start of the omega end the other end you can see is different it has a different structure that's not the omega end um, we call this the methyl end. The omega end is the methyl end. So when we count from the omega end, we count till we encounter a double bond. So we got one, two, three. Our first double bond is on the third carbon, which makes this fatty acid an omega-3. Now, if our first double bond was on the sixth carbon, which is this one, then that would be an omega-6. Now, there's a double bond there, but the first double bond is on the omega is on the three carbon from the omega end, so that makes this an omega-3 fatty acid. So when we're talking about omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, that's all we're talking about is the location of the double bond, and that gives them very different characteristics. Okay, so now we know what a triglyceride is, we know what a fatty acid is, and we know what an omega-3 and an omega-6 fatty acid is. Now I wanna talk about a phospholipid. And really all that buildup was to get to phospholipids. So a phospholipid is really similar to a triglyceride. So you still have that glycerol background, like a triglyceride, and you still have fatty acids. But in this case, we have two fatty acids. And then we have just another compound stuck on here in place of that third fatty acid. And we also have, you know, it's a phospholipid, so there's a phosphorus right there. So it's pretty similar to a triglyceride, except it has two fatty acids and then some other compound here. Don't worry about that other compound for now. But that's what a, fat, a phospholipid is. So why do we care about phospholipids? Well, the reason we care about phospholipids is because the cell membranes on all the cells of our body are composed of phospholipids. And they're, they're placed in a double layer, a double layer of phospholipids. So this is showing the phospholipid bilayer. And that other compound that takes the place of a fatty acid was right here that I said, don't worry about. And then we have two fatty acid tails. Those are the fatty acid tails. And so you can see all of the phospholipids and how they're arranged in the phospholipid bilayer membrane. And this makes up every single cell of your body. 
Now these fatty acid tails can be saturated fatty acids, they can be omega-3s, they can be omega-6s, they can be lots of different types of fatty acids. And it turns out that, you know, what determines the types of fatty acids in the facet, fat, fatty tails is what you eat. So the types of fats that you eat end up incorporated in these fatty acid tails. So if you eat lots of omega-3 fatty acids, you have lots of omega-3s in here. If you eat lots of omega-6s, you have lots of omega-6s in there. And the same with saturated versus unsaturated fats. So the fatty acids that we eat are modified before they end up in the phospholipid bilayer. The omega-3 fatty acids are modified by desaturase and elongase, and they become something called EPA, or eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA. If you've heard of fish oils, you've heard of EPA. It's one of the, one of the fats in fish oils, okay? And the omega-6 fatty acids, well, they become something called arachidonic acid, Okay, so EPA is still an omega-3, arachidonic acid is still an omega-6. Now the same enzyme does the conversions of both of these. And that enzyme, uh, there's competition for the enzyme. So the more omega-3 we have, the more omega-3 we, we end up with in our phospholipid bilayer. The more omega-6 we eat, the more omega-6s end up in our phospholipid bilayer, okay? Now I want to say something about uh, this process. Now it turns out that this conversion here of omega-3 uh, uh, alpha linolenic acid to EPA, the conversion, well it's not very efficient. And as it turns out in males we get about maybe a 3% conversion at best, but females up to about 8%. It seems like estrogen is involved in that process and improves the conversion rate for females. So, you know, it's not, a, it's not an impressive conversion rate, but when we are eating more alpha-linoleic acid, we do end up with more EPA in our phospholipid membranes, our, our bilayer membrane. Now, you can consume EPA directly to, to not have to deal with that conversion process. You don't have to worry about the conversion if you're consuming EPA directly and we get EPA directly from fish oils. So that's one reason why people consume fish oils. Um, all plant sources of omega-3, like flax, they happen to be alpha-linolenic acid, and this is why the plant sources are not as effective as the animal sources of omega-3, because they're not converted um, very efficiently. The plant sources are not converted to EPA very efficiently, and it's EPA that's the omega-3 that ends up in the phospholipid bilayer. So now we have various amounts of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids incorporated in our phospholipid bilayer here. And the cell decides that it needs some fatty acids to make signaling molecules. So it's gonna grab some of these fatty acid tails. And it does that with an enzyme called phospholipase A2. And so uh, it's either going to end up grabbing EPA or arachidonic acid, depending on what's there. And again, remember, if we consume lots of EPA, we'll have more EPA there. If we consume uh, lots of omega-6, we'll have more arachidonic acid there. This is omega-6. This is an omega-3. So what phospholipase A2 grabs and pulls out of the bilayer depends on what's there. Well, here's where we start to get into some of the inflammatory and anti-inflammatory effects. So if we grab a arachidonic acid, which is an omega-6, the enzyme COX-2 and 5 LOX will convert that arachidonic acid into some, uh, into some products, some signaling molecules. It'll produce either anti-inflammatory prostaglandins or inflammatory prostaglandins and thromboxanes. So it could go either way, okay? So those are the signaling molecules that are produced from arachidonic acid, or our, our omega-6. Now our omega-3, our EPA, well, it's gonna be converted to <clears throat> anti-inflammatory resolvents, less inflammatory leukotrienes, and our omega-3 
fatty acid EPA can be converted to DHA, which is also an omega-3. And then that omega-3 DHA can be converted to anti-inflammatory resolvents. So let's, let's stop and look at this for a second. Um, if you're consuming fish oil, you'll see on the label that it reports the quantities of EPA and DHA. Those are the two main omega-3 fatty acids in fish oil. But we see that the body can produce DHA from EPA. Okay, so if we're consuming lots of fish oils or omega-3 fatty acids, you see that we're producing anti-inflammatory resolvents, less inflammatory leukotrienes, and more anti-inflammatory resolvents. Whereas if we're consuming lots of omega-6 fatty acids, well, we could get some anti-inflammatory prostaglandins, but there's also a pathway to get inflammatory prostaglandins and thromboxanes. So here's another effect of omega-3 fatty acids. EPA can interfere with the function of something called uh, neurotropic factor uh, kappa B, NF kappa B. So NF kappa B is a signaling molecule and it turns on the production of more signaling molecules called inflammatory cytokines. The inflammatory cytokines activate the immune system and turn on inflammation. Well, EPA blocks that process. So it turns off the inflammatory effect of NF kappa B. So that's another reason why fish oils, especially containing EPA, would be considered anti-inflammatory. So taken together, what the theory proposes is that we need to look at the omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. Because I showed you on an earlier slide that one of the products of omega-6 fatty acids were inflammatory prostaglandins and thromboxanes, right? But over on the omega-3 side, we didn't really see any inflammatory products. We saw less inflammatory and anti-inflammatory products. So the theory is that if your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is too high, that you're tilting the balance towards inflammation and that you get more inflammation. That's really the whole theory, you know. What's a high ratio? Well, we don't know exactly. Um, so we know that the standard American diet, that uh, the ratio is probably s somewhere around, you know, 10 to 20 omega-6 you know, to one, omega-3, and many people have recommended that that should be closer to one to three omega-6 for every omega-3. So, um, but you know, we don't, we don't know enough to be able to recommend hard and fast numbers really, but that's a theory. But I want you to remember something from the previous slide. And from the previous slide, you saw that the omega-6 uh, fatty acid, arachidonic acid, well, it can also produce anti-inflammatory prostaglandins. So there's a, there's a branch point here, you know, where we can produce anti-inflammatory or inflammatory signaling molecules, and we don't yet know enough about the regulation of that pathway. And it could be in some individuals that omega-6 fatty acids primarily trigger the anti-inflammatory pathway and that they're not really going to get increased inflammation from consuming a high, a high omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. But again, we need more research really to understand what's going on there. Well, here's another interesting finding. You know, I showed you earlier that EPA interferes with NF-kappa B stimulation of inflammatory cytokine production. Well, it turns out that hydrogen peroxide activates NF-kappa B. Well, it's been found that omega-6 fatty acids can reduce hydrogen peroxide. The, the uh, double bonds in the N6 fatty acid basically take up some of the um, oxygen free radicals from hydrogen peroxide and convert it to inert water. So the hydrogen peroxide becomes inert water. If we have less hydrogen peroxide, then we have less activation of NFKB. And so in an indirect way, N6 fatty acids or omega-6 fatty acids can also inactivate NF-kappa B so they can reduce inflammation. So this is uh, maybe a little bit uh, counter-regulatory to that inflammatory uh, response. 
Well, here's another benefit of omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-6 fatty acids can be converted to something called epoxy eicosatrienoic acid, say that twice fast, we just call it EEC, through an enzyme called cytochrome P450 epoxygenase. So what is EEC? Well, EEC relaxes vascular smooth muscles. It relaxes the smooth muscles of the vessels, and that tends to result in less damage and reduces um, uh, heart disease and possibly blood pressure. So that's a, that's a positive effect from omega-6 fatty acids. And finally, other studies have shown that omega-6 fatty acids are associated with a reduction in, in uh, interleukin-6 and RA, which are inflammatory cytokines, actually reduces them and can increase TGF beta, which is anti-inflammatory. So, you know, in the classic theory, you know, the, the balance between omega-6s and omega-3s determines inflammation. If we have lots of omega-6s, we get inflammation. If we have um, more omega-3s, we get um, anti-inflammation. But I've shown you some counter evidence that in some pathways, omega-6 fatty acids can lead to anti-inflammatory responses. So now you should be asking the question, so what do I do? <laughs> you know, um, you know, if I believe the classic theory, then I should load up on fish oils, but, and I should avoid omega-6 fatty acids like the plague. Um, but I've shown you some counter evidence. <clears throat> um, so if you ask me what, what should I do, I would probably tell you, I don't know definitively what the answer is. Um, I don't think the research is at the point where we can make real definitive statements, but I do think we can make some, some sound recommendations. So here's what I would recommend. We know that you need some EPA and DHA, right? So the classic plant sources of omega-3s, the alpha-linolenic acid, it's not converted to EPA and DHA um, at a high efficiency. So we're getting maybe 3% for males, 8% for females. And we know that the EPA and DHA are anti-inflammatory. They have some anti-inflammatory effects. So, you know, the general recommendation is somewhere around three to 500 milligrams a day. A, a teaspoon of fish oil will take care of that. Um, or a couple of servings of fatty fish per week. So that's a good solid recommendation. And you should think about doing that. The best sources of omega-3 fatty acids are fatty fish. And as, as I said, not the plant sources because they're not converted at a high efficiency. Well, should I worry about natural sources of omega-6? You know, if I'm worried about um, possibly tilting the balance towards inflammation. Well, I don't know, but I don't think so. I don't, I don't personally worry about natural sources of omega-6, like uh, say in uh, nuts, walnuts and almonds, that kind of a thing. Should I worry about highly processed oils like canola oil that are processed at high heat with lots of chemical solvents? I'm a little bit more concerned about those. Um, you know, because of the high heat, because of the chemical solvents, um, although I don't have a whole lot of direct research evidence, you know, to back up those views. Um, if you were asking me what to do, um, you know, my recommendation would be exactly that. Get some EPA and DHA, you know, a good source of uh, fish oil or fatty fish. Don't worry about so much the omega-6 fatty acids that you get in natural foods, but the highly chemically processed stuff, that may be something you want to minimize. Well, that's all for today, folks. I hope you found it to be interesting and informative. Um, if you have any questions, just head on over to my site and uh, drop me an email or submit a comment and I'll get back with you. If you found it to be useful and enjoy the presentation, please spread the word. Thanks for listening.